Good morning, everybody. We are here today um, for this webinar on the Protection of Personal Information Act. We understand and we know that there are many other people who are going to be joining us. Actually, we've got um, uh, almost uh, plus minus 80 people who have signed up for this webinar. And uh, we know that others are still joining us. Um, we will accept people on the platform as they uh, log on. OK, now uh, we want to start right away with the uh, webinar so that at least we're able to uh, make headway with the issues we need to cover. There are a number of issues we want to cover today and we want to believe that we shall be able to finish probably um, in an hour, an hour and a half, depending on the questions we receive. But just some housekeeping uh, rules that I would, I would like to um, share with you. Please, if you have a question as we go along with our presentation, I would like you to type those up in the uh, slot where you are able to um, type in your computer and we'll be able to respond uh, to those questions at the end of the webinar and we can address whatever question you have. But now, just to get started. First, my name is Mandlam Tebu. I am here at head office at AEE. Many of you know me, and um, I'm the COO at AEE. And today, we are here to share this important information with all of you. My presentation will uh, take the form of plus minus 25 slides which will cover some of the most crucial issues that you need to know concerning the Poppy Act. Over the past weeks, I'm sure you know that we have sent to you um, memos that talk to this particular um, issue of the Poppy Act, and there are a number of other documents which we have uh, made available to all of you through our website. And please do check our website from time to time so that at least you are able to keep uh, updated on the new information that we keep on sharing. Now, to start on the Poppy Act, I want to just begin by addressing the first question that many people tend to ask when you talk to them about the Poppy Act. The question is usually, does it apply to schools? Yes, indeed. The Poppy Act will apply to all schools and all other entities. In summary, all schools are required to put appropriate and reasonable technical and organizational measures into place to secure the integrity and confidentiality of any personal information in their position or control. The school must establish and maintain both technological and physical safeguards in respect to all electronic, digital, and physical personal data. The school must identify reasonable foreseeable risks and regularly verify that all safeguards are effective and then updated and respond to control breaches or new risks. As you know that sometimes you find that as you go on in the year, there are new things you identify which may be either loopholes to accessing personal information. And you as a school, you have a responsibility to make sure that you actually safeguard and you close those loopholes. Now, I just want to go to the next slide, which talks about data protection in South Africa. Just the historical background to this. What is the current status of data protection and regulation in South Africa? The first um, uh, point of reference we have is common law, which is the Roman Dutch law that we know, which is based on uh, common sense notions in that everyone has a right to, to privacy. And that right to privacy is enshrined in our constitution. Chapter two of our constitution, which is the Bill of Rights, states very clearly that everyone has a right to privacy. Now, that right to privacy has found meaning in a number of acts, but to mention just two of those acts, the first one is the Promotion of Access to Information Act, PAIA, which again seeks to look at how the access to information can be promoted without having to violate people's privacy. And this one now we are talking about today is very specific because it is the Protection of Personal Information Act, things which are personal to you as a person or as an entity. And then, of course, there are other applicable legislation that we have in the country, which I will not go into. 
Now, let us define personal data or personal information. In the act itself, personal information or personal data is defined as information relating to an identifiable living natural person and where it is applicable an identifiable existing juristic person, including but not limited to religion, gender, um, race, contact details of a person, financial information like banking details, age of a person, marital status, physical address where you live, disability, medical information, education, salary info of a person, criminal. You know, there are a number of um, sort of um, things which have been identified as part of that category of what is termed personal information. I will not go into detail with each one of those, but I'm sure you can see this on the screen and you can probably be able to relate to some of them. And the list I have there is not exhaustive at all because uh, there is even more to that that than we can put up here. So we always advise that you also go to the act itself and read the act so that you can know those other details. Now, the next point which we want to address is who are the role players when it comes to this issue of protecting personal information? The first one is the data subject. The data subject um, is the employee, parent or learner or anyone who's the owner of that information. That is the data subject as described in the act. Number two is the responsible party. That is the person who is able to process that data or information. In our case, it is the employer, which is the school in this case. You as a school, you are the responsible party. And as a result, you are the one who decides the purpose of data processing. That means the information that you ask from people, what it's going to be used for and how. Number two, the way in which the personal data should be processed. And the third role player in this whole scheme of things is the operator, which is also the third party service providers, for example, AEE in this case. As suppliers of the curriculum and other uh, products to you, we are a third party that sometimes may need you to supply us with um, information which may be personal like um, names of um, learners or, or ID numbers, etc. All of that is still personal information, which we as a third party will also be able to process. Number four is the information regulator, IR. The information regulator was appointed by the president. Um, the person in that office right now is Advocate Penzi Takula. At the end of this presentation, we'll provide you with the contact details of that. So that is the person put in charge of making sure that all entities in our country are compliant when it comes to the Poppy Act. And then, of course, the information officer. The, the information officer is the person in your school whom you appoint as a school or school principal or school management to be in charge of managing um, personal information and data in your school. That's very important to note because you need to have by now appointed that person. But nevertheless, we know that some of the schools have not done so. Uh, you still have got time because um, many of these things, they kick in on the 1st of July this year. Now, the next slide talks about what is processing of personal information because that's a question you also get. Processing is anything that is done with personal information of a data subject. It is a person who owns the information, including number one, the collection of that information, organization of that information, the storage, where do you store it, you know, disclosure of such information, transmission of that information, whether electronically or otherwise, you know, access and the use of that information is very important because all of those things, they, they are tantamount to processing of um, uh, personal information. Next is, um, again, continuing with this issue of processing. Bobia will only apply to the processing of personal information entered in a record by automated or non-automated means like a computer etc you know sometimes uh, you find that uh, people will ask you your id number even on the phone and online all of that is are things which are covered by poppy 
And where the employer is domiciled in South Africa or is not domiciled in South Africa, but makes use of automated or non-automated means in South Africa to capture that personal data. And POPIA will not apply to the processing of personal in information if, number one, it is for a personal or household activity, if it has been sufficiently de-identified, that means you are unable to see whose information is this, okay? If it is by a public body for the purposes of national security, for example, if you are to be appointed to a senior position in government or a board in government in, in the state, they do what is termed vetting, they vet you and go through what is termed also a security check. In such a case, they have a right to access personal information. Sometimes even by the police when they're doing investigation, they can access your computer, even your cell phone, without you having to give consent because they are doing an investigation. If it is performed by the cabinet or if it relates to the judicial functions of court, like the Zonda Commission, they are able to go into people's records to investigate whatever issue they want to put forward and, and, and deal with at the commission. I'm just giving you some examples so you can understand now. Now, what are the conditions um, for lawful processing of information? In terms of the Poppy Act, there are eight conditions for lawful processing uh, of information. First is accountability and purpose, specification, meaning you need to specify clearly why you want my information. And the information that you're going to process, processing limitation, is to do with also the limitations that you have in processing personal information. For example, if you are taking my phone number because you want to call me when there are meetings, I don't expect you to share my phone number with someone where they're going to phone me marketing whatever product because you would have actually breached um, the whole purpose of you having asked for my phone number. Further present limitations also, information quality itself, in that the, the, the information must be of good quality, accessible, and um, easy, easy to uh, make use of. You know, openness, security safeguards. How are you going to secure the information that you are getting from people? Data subject participation, that's about giving consent. You know, as a data subject, say, I consent to you making use of my personal information. Justification for processing of personal information. Yeah, I just posed a questions which probably would be of, 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 of interest to you as schools. That in terms of popular, can a school conduct a credit record check without a job applicant's or employee's consent, or even a parent for that matter? We will answer those questions. Will a school be able to process an application for admission using a form that demands certain personal information of the parents or guidance? Can an employer, this is school in this case, disclose an employee's personal information, for example, their bank details to a payroll provider? You know, these are questions which I'm sure you're, you're, you're going to have. For number one, for example, you cannot conduct a credit check without a consent. You need a consent from the person. Number two, can the school be able to process an option form for admission using a form that demands certain personal information? Yes, it can, but you need to get a consent also from parents that we will need you to put in your street address, your phone number, email address. There must be a consent from the parents, you know. Can the employer provide such information or disclose it uh, um, for the uh, case, I mean, in the case of a bank, detail or payroll, which concerns an employer or, a, or employee. Even there, you need to have consent. All the way, consent is very, very important. Let's go on now with justification for processing of personal information. Permissible grounds on which personal information is allowed to be processed are as follows. Number one, consent by the employee. Number two, processing is necessary for contract to which the employee is a party. Number three, that there's a legal obligation to perform processing of such information. Number four, protection of a legitimate interest of the employee, very important. Number five, public law duty by a public body where it has to perform that function because it needs your personal information. Number six, 
necessary to pursue the legitimate interest of the employer or third party is very important. For example, if your employer is, is organizing a pension fund or provident fund for you, they will need your personal information, such as ID number, etc. It's very important. Now, let's look at spatial information. Spatial personal information. Can an employer require an employee or job applicant to undergo a medical test? Yo, interesting one. Can an employer conduct a criminal record check without an employee or job applicant's consent? Can an employer upload photos of its employees on the company website or on social media platforms without any consent? Now, let's just go on to look at that. What is that spatial personal information? Again, in all those cases, consent is paramount. Okay. Now, spatial personal information has to do with religion or philosophical beliefs. You know, you would violate somebody's uh, personal information if you actually sort of um, uh, display or expose whatever belief they have, which they have not declared. Like somebody's a Satanist, God forbid, you know, and you, dis you, you disclose that to everyone at work, you know, you would have violated their privacy right. Race or ethnic origin, you know, you discover or discover that all. Uh, Mandela's grandfather is actually white. This guy is not as black as he looks, you know, something like that. Just a bizarre example for you to remember. You know, trade union membership, you know, political persuasion, you know, health and sex life. In these days, good people, you know out there in schools that we are dealing with transgender, we're dealing with, you know, homosexuality, etc. These are all the issues which are upon us as Christians. And I think we do need to be aware of these issues. So that this, we don't find ourselves in courts answering questions we would have avoided if we knew how to behave. Biometric information or data, you know, like fingerprints, etc. It's very important also to know that is spatial personal information. Criminal behavior, even record, you know, as schools uh, in terms of SAIS registration now. SAIS requires that for a teacher to be registered with SAIS, they need to submit a PCC, which is a police clearance certificate, which talks about um, criminal behavior if you have ever been convicted of a crime, etc. Even sexual offenses are covered in that particular space. So all of that is called spatial personal information. Let me go on to also another category of spatial personal information and how to process that. Processing of spatial personal information is prohibited, prohibited, let me underline, prohibited unless the employee consent is there. There must be a consent to the processing. Number two, the information has deliberately been made public by the employee. If you're going to put your lifestyle that you live this kind of life, that um, during the wee hours you are you are a party animal who do all of these things that we look at and we're like, oh my goodness, very interesting. We don't we, we don't know the judge. If you have made that publicly available, then you have really forfeited your right because it's out there in the public domain. The processing is necessary for establishment, exercise, or defense of a right or obligation to comply with the law. Again, the next one is the processing is for historical, statistical, academic, or scientific research. Again, if you do not need it for the express purpose of those things, you are not allowed to process that information. Number five. The regulator has granted authority for the processing in the public interest and there are appropriate security safeguards in place. Again, you can process such information. Uh, it is in accordance with the specific circumstances prescribed by the Poppy Act. Those are um, circumstances which are prohibited unless we have those particular one, two, three, one, two, three four, five, six conditions in place. Next one. Now the rights of the data subjects. It is my right and your right also as a data subject. An employee or even a learner or a person or anyone that you deal with has the right to have her 
or his personal information processed in accordance with the conditions for lawful processing, including the right to inter alia, number one, be notified that personal information about her or him is being collected and or has been accessed or acquired by an authorized person. It's very important to inform me that Amanda, we've got your um, personal information on this particular aspect of your life uh, being captured by uh, our information officer, and we would like you to give your consent about that information. Number two, to establish whether he or his employer holds information about the employee and requests access to such information. An employer may, however, refuse access based on the grounds in PAIA. PAIA is the Promotion of Access to Information Act, PAIA. All right. So I have a right to go to, to Graham and say, Graham, um, I need to know if you've got any information about me regarding blah, 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 whatever. And he, he has a, an obligation to confirm or not confirm that. But also he can say, if he does, 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 does not want to confirm, he can say, Manda, I'm not at liberty to divulge that to you because of X, Y, Z. Give the reasons why. Number C, to request the correction, construction, or deletion of her or his personal information. You can go and request it. Please, I would like you to delete this information. For example, someone or AEE media team, marketing team, they capture me, you know, probably talking about whatever and they put me on the AEE website or AEE Facebook page, and I see this and I'm like, ah, no, 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 please, good people, can you delete this information? Really, I am, I'm, an, I'm not comfortable with it being out there in the public domain. So you have the right to do so. Or to object on the reasonable grounds to processing of her or his, her or his personal information. Number five, to submit a complaint to the regulator or institute civil proceedings. It's very important that if there's information that is personal, which is captured, and there's no compliance on the side of the person who has captured my personal data, I can complain to the information regulator or even follow the grievance procedures within my organization or school. It's, it's, it's very important. Now, I'm gonna cover steps to comply, just generally. Number one, transitional period of 12 months was given, and now it's, it's, it's implementation time right now. You need to be implementing Poppy Act in your school, right? And um, the date for implementation is the 1st of July this year. Make sure that you have done whatever you need to do by the 1st of July. Number two, review and develop standard clauses around data protection in employment contracts and workplace policies. That means you need to update your policies and procedures as a school as to how you manage data. Number three, conduct an audit as to what personal information is held by your school. Where is it held and by whom? Who has personal information of parents of your children, information of your children, your staff members, etc. You need to do that audit right now and be and know exactly what is worth before you find yourself in a situation where you are charged with non-compliance. Number four, establish what personal information is collected in one place and transferred to another. For example, information that is collected, for example, at a level of uh, admission of a learner. And where does that information go? You need to be clear. Uh, of the processes within your school. Number five, develop group wide standard data protection policies and protocols if not already in place. It's important. What are the protocols? Who is in charge of managing information flow within your school? With whom does the buck stop? Because you cannot be pointing left, right and center uh, when there are questions being asked. There must be someone who is responsible. Number six, Establish means to comply with notification requirements in that you need to be able to have even forms for consent, etc. That's very important to have. Number seven, appoint an information officer and a deputy information officer for purposes of phobia and promotion 
of Access to Information Act. It's very important to have those people. The deputy is the person who will be in charge of things if your information officer is not there. But also, even though your information officer is there, the deputy will always assist that person in managing and making sure that there are systems in place to control and manage information. Now, popular toolkit, journey towards compliance. We have made this available on our website and we will urge you to go there to get those documents. Document 1 to 17 related to the journey are available on the A website for the schools to download as templates, suggestions, etc. Documents can be downloaded from our AE Poppy Act Toolkit, which is in the website. Please make sure you check that. Number two, we want to urge you, really, please appoint the school information officer. Okay, that's very important. That's the first thing you need to do. Maybe from this webinar, go back to your office and think carefully, contact your management team and ask who can we appoint as the information office. But it's very important. We've got a document which is, is going to guide you through that process. Those are the documents are those are the documents outlined there. Document one. See the document number two also for guidelines for the appointment of the information officer and how to register the information officer. Okay. And also number three is open a school poppy file, which means this is a file where you're going to keep all your poppy policies and uh, forms and everything that you need to make sure that you are compliant with Poppy. Please open a file now or a filing cabinet in your office that you just pull out. It's got all the documents to do with Poppy and put a big label there, Poppy, and also have a key to lock it up. It's important that you lock it up that not anyone or everyone can access. I mean, sometimes I, I, I've often gotten surprised to the extent of ease with which people can access even human resource material for staff members. You know, some of you even hear people talking about other people's salaries. You're like, what's that? You know, in certain entities, I'm sure you don't do that. Now, the next one also, two kids continued, the journey towards compliance. Number four, we ask you to download document 5 for PX as well as document 6 which talks about the promotion of access to information act by year. Place these in your file, the file I spoke about in number three. They ought to be read by at least the school's information officer for general insight and understanding. So if you appoint someone as a school's information officer, that person should have the appetite to read all of these documents. There must be a walking encyclopedia for the Poppy Act. Stop them on the veranda and ask them a question. They can answer it like that. Wake them up at 12 midnight principal and just ask them a question, just to test them if they can answer your questions. No, I'm joking, but it's important for the information officer to actually know the Poppy Act in and out so that they can manage it properly. Number five, schedule the following staff meetings either collectively or separately. From here, it's important to have your school management team or whatever name you call that team, but the top management and have them uh, in a meeting where you are going to um, discuss the Poppy Act, even make use of this slide. You can make these slides available to you, by the way. You can get them, you know, and you can make use of, of the slides and all the documents we have referred to are available for you. We'll make them uh, easily available to you. Some are already on our website. Number two, school administrative team. That is from your receptionist to uh, PAs, etc. They need to know. And good people, it's very important that people know that if somebody phones your school and asks, uh, can I speak to the principal? Uh, I'm sorry, the principal is not here. Can I have his cell number or her cell number? They mustn't give the cell number away without your consent. They would have to say, sorry, sir, I can't give you the cell number, but can you please give me your cell number or email address so that I can get them to contact you? That's very important to know. Or unless you have allowed your PA or secretary or receptionist to give your number to people, that's fine. 
then don't blame her when people call you at 10 at, at night asking you about school stuff, uh, invading your private space. <laughs> the, the next one is C, school teachers. School, all your teachers in the school need to know and understand the prescripts of the Poppy Act, just the general points about what it means, because it's very, very important. You find that it's very easy to answer a question when an outsider or someone is asking you something about somebody and you answer without thinking. Lo and behold, we have given out important personal information, like the name of a child. Oh, by the way, what's the name of that child? That, that child over there. And just give the name without even thinking. We have given out personal information without thinking. So it's very important for teachers to actually understand this. Again, the toolkit continue. The detail of the issues to be covered in the respective meetings that I've spoken about above is covered in the document entitled Poppy Toolkit Guidelines. In summary, in those meetings, ensure all employees understand the concept, meaning, and application of the Poppy Act. This can be done by watching a video that explains the Act. Refer to document 7, Poppy Monitoring and Training Resources, which is available there. It is essential that all school stakeholders have a sound awareness of poppy. Very important. Now, let me just talk to you about the risks. This is not to scare you, but to make you to be aware. Risk facing organizations or entities if there is non compliance with the Poppy Act. If organizations fail to comply with the poppy requirements, this may give rise to serious risks such as number one, which is one and only, a fine. The information regulator can find you. Administrative fines such as those prescribed in the poppy act, are uh, they in the act, up to 10 million rands fines and or up to 10 years imprisonment by responsible officials. This is very important to know. Of course, 10 million is calculated according to the uh, size of the company and all of those things, but it's up to, meaning it can be any amount less than that, of course. It depends on the breach of the act itself and the, the charge you are facing in the court of law if someone were to lay charges against you. It's very important to actually note this. Up to 10 million, not that it's 10 million, okay, and also up to 10 years, not that it's 10 years. It can be six months, can be maybe one week in jail, I don't know, you know, but the charge will decide. But they're just giving the maximum fine you can actually be charged if you violate the act. So it's very important for us to actually know this. Okay. Now let me just summarize some of the points we've covered. Data collection, the type of data, purpose, consent, legal aspects, minimality, and transparency. We've covered that aspect, data collection. Number two is data access and accuracy. It must be always correct, complete, reliable. Process of updating information is also very important to note. Number three, data usage and restrictions. Purpose, relevance, restrictions, legality, permission, um, and limitations, okay? Number four, data storage. It's important, good people. Physical storage of data, like in your your shelves in your office, office site, you know, electronic in your computer, have passwords, you know, to make sure you've printed your data. Backup, cloud storage up there in the cloud. Uh, number five, data security safeguards, again, physical, electronic, network, password control, disaster recovery, okay? Okay, sorry, I've got a question here which has come through, which I'm going to answer during question time, okay? All right, they've just given me a question here. But let me go on to the summary. Disclosure, legality of disclosure. You need to make sure that you're doing something legally. Consent, data subject awareness, data request handling. Number seven, the responsibilities. Who is responsible? All directors, top management, information officer, personal dealing with personal information, vendors, contractors, suppliers. That means you as the principal or administrator, you're also responsible, not just the information officer. Because when questions come about data that has been sort of um, either abused, uh, with abuse coming from abnormal use, abused, abused, you may be questioned as a principal also. 
because you are the overseer, you must make sure that you, you, you make sure that every prescript of your policy is adhered to. Number eight, complaints. When someone is complaining process, handling, legalities, transparency. Number nine, retention, keeping of the data. Remember that you can keep the data of a person as long as you need it. If the need to keep the data has, has ceased, no longer exists, you have to destroy the data, which is number 10 again, destruction of data. The schedule as to how often do you get rid of data you no longer need. Implement staff awareness, training, of course, all staff, current staff, new appointees, regular refresher training. It's important. Keep on updating that information on your staff. Keep them updated on these issues. It is very important. Thank you and God bless. Now, I just want to put this up because now we've come to the Q&A, question and answer. I've got a question that's been put through to me right now. The question is, if the staff resigns, staff member resigns from your school, can he or she request all his or her certificates and CV back as he or she is no longer a member of the school? Of course, yes, you no longer need to keep that. Please give it back to them. But I want to assume that they would have actually submitted certified copies of those documents. So it's important that you give it back to them if they need it, because if you no longer need to keep it, you will need to destroy it after a certain time anyway. So if they want it back as they leave your school, please can I have my certificates back? Can I have my CV, everything back? It's fine, you can give it to them, no problem at all, because you won't be needing it. Any other questions? I've got um, three ladies in front of me here who are catching some of the questions, and I'm trying to find out. Are there any questions? No questions. Wow. I want to believe that you have understood everything we've shared, but let me just share with you now the contact details of the information regulator. The information regulator is Advocate Pensi Chakula, that is the website you can go to to uh, look for information on how to register your information officer. But we can assist you with that information also if you email us. And also we've given you the email of the complaints registration officer. It's Miss Manoko Mofubetsuane. Very interesting name. Very interesting. Sounds musical. Mofubetsuane. So that's the person you can contact. Uh, this is address in Joburg. They have not given us their phone number. I'm sure they're inundated with good phone calls. So there's an email address there also. We can make this available to you on request if you need it. Thank you very much. And God bless you. Enjoy the rest of your day. But let me just announce to you that every quarter we're going to be having a webinar like this on different aspects and issues that impact independent schools. So please watch the space for any communication coming from the AEE office telling you that there's a webinar on this and that. It's important that you know these things because we don't want you to be in trouble with the law because you are not complying and you just did not know. There's a Latin maxim that says ignorance of the law is not excused. We don't want you to be in that position. Thank you very much and God bless you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Looks like there's a question. The ladies are giving me a question. And uh, the question is, can I just read there? Can, we, can you please read for me? I've got somebody here who's going to read it for me. So when and to who do we send the information concerning the information officer? Where and to whom? OK. When? when you want to register your information officer, we want to advise you to click Click on the website address we've given you. There it will tell you exactly how to register your information officer with the information regulator. When you click there, it, there's a, a sort of a, an, an icon that says, if you want to register an information officer, you'll be able to go in there and fill in whatever form is there and information and you register them. So just go on the website. 
Now, the question it does, the concern always has to be in writing. Yes, it has to be in writing. It has to be in writing, people. When people tell you things verbally, there's always a temptation and a tendency when there's trouble. They simply just say, I'm sorry, I never said that. You're lying. Whereas if you've got things in writing, you must, you are able to produce a form that they signed. We have given out a form for consent on our website, but also if you need that form, we can even email it to you, a form you can use, you can tweak it accordingly, but we've got a standard form, which is kind of like a pro forma form, which you can look at and even have your school logo on the form, and then the consent for information so that parents and other one and any other person can sign to give their consent. It's important that the consent is given in writing and signed for. Another question, ladies? Another question that's come through to me now. How does this apply to handing over accounts to debt collectors? Is the information required by the department? Okay exempt from copy okay that question we, we we're going to answer both of them it's fine no, it's fine it's fine no, it's fine okay yes it does apply to handling to to to, to 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 handing over accounts for debt collection it applies that means you will write to the parent who has not paid the school fees and say we are going to hand you over for debt collection because we have not responded to our request to make payment. And that means we are going to give our debt collectors your contact details so that they can contact you and you can even negotiate with them how you're going to make payment. Inform them and get their consent. But if they don't want to sign any consent, you have a right you remember some of the slides I shared where you are able to make use of information because you as an employer or as a, a, a creditor, you have to process that information. It's very important to know that you have a right to do so. You can give that to the debt collector, even to the credit bureau, because that person has breached a contract which they signed with you. It's very important. And it's also important to make sure that probably at the very beginning, at the very beginning, of admission of a learner. We have that form of consent signed. In that form, we would urge you to also have a clause that says, should payments not be made, we, we, we will be handing over the account to debt collectors and your personal information will be utilized in that case. And then when they sign that form, they are consenting from the onset that you can use that information. It's very important. The other question is the question about um, whether the information covered by POPI will be uh, 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 needed by the DBA on SSMs. SSMs is the South African School Administration and Management System. We have dealt with this at NICE level at the National um, Alliance of Independent Schools Association with DPE. DPE has promised that information that is personal Number one, they themselves, they keep it very safe. They have promised to keep it safe if it's needed, but also they don't ask information which is not necessary for their statistics. Remember some of the areas where we said uh, personal, personal information is prohibited unless it is for stats purposes, it's for research. So that is where this applies. So in terms of OPS, OPS you can give such information because they need that for their own stats. It's very important to note that. Any other questions? I'm getting questions here. They are all coming. Well, when is the act implemented? First of July, you need to be compliant. Yes, when is the act going to be implemented? It's already operational. You must have your systems in place. But the first of July, you must have registered your information officer. It's very, very important. Number two. How long do we have to get the technological aspects we need to use? Well, all you need to do is make sure that whatever information you have and is not kept in a computer, but kept on files or hard copies, is properly secured by just having an office that can be locked, filing cabinet that can be locked, 
and the keys are kept by one person or that person who has the responsibility to, to secure that information you can do that. And then, of course, with time, you can migrate towards having all of that information, which is hard copy, to be electronically. So really, there's no time frame. It's a matter of you making sure that what you have right now is properly secured. Number three, we have parents joining us in our field trips. How do we control the taking of photos? We are covering even this aspect in our um, AEE Association newsletter that is coming up well, next week, I think. But the point we want to make is that it is important to inform parents that because of the Poppy Act, whatever pictures that they take of learners, they need to make sure that they get the consent of those learners to take the pictures. For example, can I take a picture of you? Would you mind? But also parents, in case of children, parents of children must give consent that yes, you can take pictures of my child as a school or on this field trip, no problem. And the use of such pictures must be something that is brought to the attention of parents. You see, those who take pictures have a tendency of simply just posting whatever pictures they took on their Facebook page and elsewhere. Again, these things are covered by Poppy. You do need to really inform people that, listen, I've taken pictures, the piece, I'm going to post them on, on Facebook. Because a person can actually lodge a complaint with the information regulator if they so choose. But um, it's something that needs to be uh, managed by the school when you've got school trips by giving uh, either a leaflet or pamphlet to parents, just advising them how to conduct themselves when it comes to taking pictures. Next question. If a student transfers to another school, do we first need consent from parents before submitting any documents? Yes, indeed. One of the things which is important to note is that there is always a learner profile file that the school has. When a learner is being transferred to another school, the letter profile file is transferred from one school to another between principals. When that happens, there's a need to involve the parent teacher and say, since you have taken your child out of our school to school X, we've got the learner profile file. The learner profile file will have the name, ID number of the child, date of birth, everything, even allergies and whatever ailment the child has, even what sports they do, all of the information is there. It's personal information. So you need to get the consent of the parent of a child because a child who is under 18 is still under the guidance of a parent who must give consent. So it's important to really uh, inform them, make them know, get their consent. Very important. What is the way forward concerning class photographs and also teachers appearing in these photographs? Very easy, just like you have always done. Most schools, they send letters to parents, hey, tomorrow we're going to be having class photographs and learners can take individual pictures or group photos with their teachers and all of that. And we ask for their consent, they sign the slip and say, okay, the child must bring it back to say, my, my, my father, my mother, my guardian has signed to say, yes, indeed, I can participate. That's what you do. What you've always done, that is just sufficient. Okay, any other questions? I've got Bui here writing, you know, like crazy and Sunri and Minette, the three ladies with me. I'm in good company. I don't know about you, but I'm, good, I'm in good company here in the office. Okay, the next question is, will a school be able to still use communication platforms like WhatsApp group, uh, you know, Teams, Zoom, etc.? Yes, indeed. You can use all of those platforms all you need to do is to inform parents, give their consent to, 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 to give their consent to say, we are using WhatsApp to communicate with learners. And in those WhatsApp, learners may even have their pictures, etc. All, all, all of that. Just get the consent that yes, my child will participate in the class on WhatsApp. My child will be able to participate in the class on Teams, you know, because these are uh, sort of uh, platforms which are open to the public sometimes, you know, anyone can view and see that. But you as a school must always put in place security measures to make sure that 
No one who is not supposed to be part of the Teams meeting is there. It's very, very, very important. Or Zoom meeting with your learners. Very important. But do inform parents and they uh, give their consent. Say, yes, we agree. It's very important. It's just to protect yourself, really. Okay. In this age of online learning, online teaching, different platforms, which are very useful in this time of COVID-19. Okay. Any other question? We're done. No questions. Thank you so much. God bless you. Please enjoy the rest of your day. If you've got any other questions, please email us at aeinfo at aeegroup.co.za. Info at aeegroup dot co dot z a or even email buoy b u y i dot majola m a j o l a at a e group dot co dot z a i'm sure you, you already have got her email address because she's the one who gave you the link you're using right now thank you so much god bless you bye bye